it's one o'clock and I'd like to welcome everybody to our special meeting to receive uh, Public Works Waste and Wastewater and Water Master Plan Update. Just a couple of housekeeping issues for staff. Commissioner Helms has to leave to go to a previously scheduled meeting at four o'clock. So help me manage the time so that the meat of the course of meal will be served and I will be looking at salad at that time. Okay, first, uh, I believe the, uh, the minutes, a portion thereof of the April 18th regular meeting relative to item 22-229, the Jesse Hems Park Master Plan Overview and Implementation. The clerk emailed that to us over the weekend. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve that portion of the minutes uh, relative to item 22-229, Jesse Helms Park Master Plan Overview and Implementation and Vote. Does anybody have any questions about that? So, none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, we move on to 22-283, Water and Sewer Master Plan Update, and I'd like to recognize Jay Fulmer of Brown and Caldwell. All right, good afternoon, everybody. All right, so we actually are gonna cover, I guess I'm gonna cover two of the agenda items in, in one presentation. So we're gonna go through the water and sewer master plan update, and we're also gonna go through the preview of the sanitary sewer uh, service boundaries. So that's kind of mid midpoint of the presentation. All right, uh, so just to recap about where we are with the master plan, this is an overview of kind of the steps we go through to get to the master plan. And right now we're about at the halfway point, uh, at least in terms of scope, we're past the halfway point in terms of time. Um, but right now we're at the finishing up the capacity assessment. So that's the stage of the master plan where we take all the models and the data we've collected and we evaluate the capacity of the water treatment plants, sewer treatment plants, conveyance systems, the collection system, and the water distribution system versus the expected population growth. And so based on any gaps that we find in that, we develop alternatives to fill those gaps so that we're providing the level of service that you're aiming for. Um, out of that, we develop a capital improvements plan for the next 20 years, and that is what gets formalized in the master plan that's the, the, the completion of the scope. So any questions about the overall roadmap? All right. Uh, looking at the same data, just in a little bit more of a detailed breakdown, the master plan is broken into 10 separate tasks. Uh, the ones shown in green are the ones that are finished. Uh, right now we're in the capacity assessment and we've also started task seven, the alternatives analysis and selection. Uh, you guys have already seen portions of that because if you recall the last couple of meetings, we've gone through the ARPA project selection and identification. So for the water system expansion part of the master plan, we're gonna use that same methodology uh, just to plot more broadly uh, to the system. So you've gotten kind of a preview of what that looks like. And um, uh, Jay, if you would, for the benefit of uh, people watching and for us, just would you tell us what all, how we task you for phase one and how it'll benefit the authority? Oh, understood, yeah. So um, for task one, uh, so you mean all of phase one, the determining boundaries? Yes, okay. oh, well, the boundaries. Uh, levels of service gotcha. and all that. All right, well, the purpose of that is that uh, in any master plan, we want to be able to capture the vision of what the board is, of what you want water and sewer to be in the county. So uh, what is the level of service? What areas do you want to serve? What's the population that you want to serve? So by going through that process, and we've had a couple of meetings on those various topics, that helps produce clarity about what the, the board is looking for in terms of what your vision for water and sewer is in the county. So we then take what we've captured in that vision and we can apply it, the engineering to decide what the various projects are. And we really had none of this before, did we? I, I don't know if I can answer that one. What, what do you mean? What we're doing now is monumental in that the boundaries and the service areas 
I, I, well, I, so, like so, so this is, Jay's talking about the master plan right now. The proposed service areas, et cetera, is, is a different discussion okay. after, after this. The, he's just, the terminology he's using here uh, about determining boundaries is basically determining the scope of what the master plan is going to set out and study. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, it is. So okay. we're going to discuss so, it yeah, so, differently. So I, you, I think there might have been some confusion between the first and second item there. When I hear fire, I usually assume run. I just did. My, my apologies. Yeah, I should have linked those. Well, let, let's get to the, to the big part then. So uh, just in terms of where we are in terms of schedule. Uh, so schedule, we are about six months behind what we said the original baseline was. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through where, where that is here in a moment. Um, everything shown in green has been completed. Uh, this uh, orange line is where we are today in late April. Um, so the places where we've lost a little bit of time on what is already completed is that temporary flow monitoring step. Um, we ran into a problem early in the project where the flow meters weren't available. We have to deploy quite a few of these and you know we're not the only ones using flow meters and so these are things that are leased they have to be available and so because we didn't have the number available we wanted we had to stage the flow monitoring and that cost us uh, a couple of months so that's that's where some of the time went. Um, where we are now and i'll get to the to the other thing in a moment uh, so where we are now is we've been working on the capacity assessment for a while and we should have the results of that. So you can think of that as a gap analysis. Let's look and see where level of service maybe doesn't line up to what we want it to line up to. Uh, should have results for you late June, early July. Uh, so just something to look forward to there. Um, let me jump into the alternatives analysis task six. That's the one that will largely follow the capacity assessment. That's where we actually look at what the solutions are, what we want to put in place for the uh, capital improvements program and we aim to have that finished and ready for y'all's uh, review and input uh, sometime in early August. Um, that's another one that we've lost a little bit of schedule but for a beneficial reason. Uh, so we uh, put some of this on pause while we're evaluating the ARPA projects. Uh, that's a good bit of modeling analysis and planning that has to go into that and input from the board. Uh, so that cost us a little bit of time under task seven just because we kind of diverted our efforts to focus on ARPA instead of on the broader <coughs> plan. So, um, so that's where that is. Uh, the remaining things, uh, capital improvements plan uh, and cash flow. One thing we're going to do is when we develop this 20-year plan, we're going to look at what that cash flow is versus what your planned cash flow is to make sure that everything matches because we want the plan to be affordable. Uh, so what we can do there is we can adjust the schedule of all the projects to match planned cash flow. So there, there's a financial component that happens there as well. Uh, and then that'll happen early October. And finally, the master plan documentation, the final document that you guys will uh, get to uh, approve, will be uh, sometime around Thanksgiving of this year. Okay. Any questions on, on progress? No. All right. Okay, so we already touched on these some decision points. I'm going to uh, skip into the sewer service area boundary, which is probably the more substantive stuff we're going to look at technically. All right, so why is the sewer service boundary important? And Dennis, I've got, Commissioner Rape, I apologize, I missed your question earlier. This probably will answer it. Is um, number one, the reason defining sewer service boundaries is important is this is how we define where sewer will be planned. So if you're inside this boundary, by definition, we're going to plan for providing sewer there, whether it's improvements to the existing system or possibly extending sewer where it doesn't exist within those boundaries. Um, outside of those boundaries, we would say that an area would require board approval prior to being served. So this kind of defines what the area of, uh, of, of sewer is. This is a little different tack than what we're taking with water because one of the things we heard from you guys is that it's very important to expand water into parts of the county but not necessarily the same would be true for sewer. So uh, this sewer service boundary will look different by definition than what we've looked at with water. 
All right. So let's start with what, what was, I guess. So this is the uh, sewer service areas per the 2016 master plan. Everything shown uh, in, in kind of this uh, tan color uh, is what was in the original 2016 master plan. Uh, and we're going to get to the point where we're going to take some of this off the table, basically, and get to the refined master plan, but just bear with me for a moment. Um, this is an overlay of the municipalities on top of that same map. Uh, and this is an overlay of the green are the gravity sewers and the yellow are the force mains in the system. Uh, as you can see from the 2016 master plan, there's quite a few areas that have no sewer at all in them, you know, particularly looking at Lake Lee and Lake Twitty uh, being two that stand out. All right. So in terms of reevaluating the sewer service boundaries areas, this is the approach we took. So we started with the 2016 master plan that had been vetted at that time for being the sewer service area boundaries. Uh, we did not change internal boundaries between basins. Um, that's largely for hydrology reasons, like, you know, the basin boundaries follow ridge lines. Like if you're on one side or the other, you're going, the water's going to flow one way or the other. If you're on one side of the ridge line, you might have to pump. So that it's a good point of separation. The areas we included were parcels that are contributing flow to existing infrastructure. So in other words, if you're currently sewered, you're in the sewer service boundary is another way to say that. Uh, planned or approved developments that are, are currently on the books, uh, donuts of unincorporated areas between towns, and areas adjacent to existing sewers that could naturally flow by gravity into that sewer. So they may not have sewer in front of those houses, but the topography is such that they could be in the future. So uh, that's if you're within, if you can think of the ridge lines as like a basin. So if you're inside the basin, you could eventually be served. Um, the areas that we specifically excluded were areas without any existing sewer infrastructure, unless you were trumped by one of the uh, criteria above, areas that aren't expected to have sewer, aren't planned to have sewer, um, excess areas around tributary areas that specifically applies to Grassy Branch. So there are some areas of Grassy Branch that by gravity could take more flow, but because that system is built out in that capacity, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to consider that to be an enlarged area. Uh, and finally, locations where private utilities have infrastructure. So. If a private utility discharges to your system, we will track it, we'll include it in our planning, but it won't be considered part of the service area boundary, if that makes sense. All right, so this is what the new one looks like. Uh, so this is a pretty substantial reduction over what we saw originally. I'm gonna show you the before and after, just so you can kind of uh, look at a comparison here, but uh, let's keep going. Uh, so this is what we're proposing for the current master plan. These will be the uh, new service area boundaries. Uh, that's an overlay with the towns. So largely Fairview and Unionville um, are, are not within the service area boundaries as are parts of Hemby Bridge. And this southern little bit of Waxhaw is out. And the reason for that is it's on the opposite side of the ridge line. And we'll drill down into that in a moment. So you can see why that one's drawn that way. And again, these are the sewers. And versus the original map, you can see now the sewer service boundary areas largely match where you actually have sewers now. So we're taking out a lot of the areas that weren't previously sewered. So this is the before and after. So the original 2016 master plan basically included everything in brown and everything in blue. So what we're going to do is everything that's shown in blue is not going to be in this master plan. So Lake Lee, Lake Twitty, and large portions of East Side uh, fall out because of the criteria we just went through. Um, so you can see over here on the left, we're showing you some of the reductions. Uh, so for example, the East Side service area was reduced by almost 80% in area. Uh, Lake Lee and Lake Twitty was 100% because we took all of those areas out. So I'm not going to go through each of those individually because y'all have got it in front of you, but um, uh, anyway, any questions so far, any reaction to what you're seeing with the changes? I have one, Jay. Are the 2022 20, acres, mm -hmm. is that total area in there or is that what's left 
that has not been so provided sewer and water line total it's total Jay, you mentioned a, a point on the areas excluded locations where private utilities have infrastructure mm -hmm. you're you're tracking the volume but you're not tracking the location or the, uh, what, yeah. what I'll show you let me bounce up to another map here to make it easier these are two <coughs> examples uh, I don't know what the name of this is but this yellow force main uh, there is uh, a jars yeah so there's a private development at the end of it we will track the fact that that produces sewer but we're not going to do flow projections or expand a sewer service area around it we're just going to track what's there and assume that that's going to be uh, static and the other one's Parkwood High School I think I think that's right yeah and we have been asked or I ask is when jar center adds goes to build a house is there any permission granted or they just tap on for for who now i'm sorry the, in the lower left quadrant the yellow line outside the service area i see um, i'm gonna have to ask brian mark you could you help him with that a little bit yeah the, i think so brian may have that answer yeah so the, if it's within the jars property the jars mm -hmm. property then they they are controlling of their flow so they certainly could add homes they could add anything within their project anything outside of that is not permitted it would have to come to this board the board would have to make decisions to allow that expansion so that's sort of a frontier down there right it's a frontier if you allow it to, to grow as far as jars is concerned they obviously can grow within their own community and uh, the other one, Parkwood, that's to serve a school and nobody can tap on to that. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right, so, um, so that's, that's, that's the big one to see really what the changes are here. Uh, so now we're gonna drill in to look at a little bit what it looks like at some of the specific towns. So we're going to zoom in to the 12 Mile Creek area, 6 Mile Crooked Creek and Poplin. We're not going to zoom into the package plants in the east, east side because those are kind of standalone uh, uh, by themselves. But we thought you might appreciate seeing some of the detail on how the towns are connected to specific wastewater treatment plants within these service areas. All right, so the first one is Waxhaw and Mineral Springs. Uh, so this brown line is the boundary for the 12 Mile Creek Basin and you can see both of these are entirely within that uh, sewer service boundary from 12 Mile Creek Pump Station. The only exception are these three little bits of wax saw that happen to be on the other side of the ridge line. So if those areas were to want to be sewered that would require board approval to to sewer those because more than likely you're going to have to build a pump station to do it because they're you have to get them over the ridge to be able to serve them jay the part of waxall that is on there that's in the city limits of waxall they are i know they're looking at a package plant and it does uh i did some Lynch's River starts in Waxhaw, mm -hmm. so it is considered a flowable. Would we have any control over that or no control? You would not have any direct control that I'm aware of other than you might be able to provide comment on their wastewater permit when they asked for it, but I don't know if you would have specific direct approval. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so moving into Marvin Weddington and Wesley Chapel. So starting with the north, Marvin and a good chunk of Weddington are in the Six Mile Basin. So that's the basin where that sewer flow winds up at Charlotte Waters McAlpine facility. Um, so most of Marvin, 70% of it, is in Six Mile, and about 30% of Weddington is. Uh, 
The remainder of Weddington is within the 12-mile basin, uh, so you can't see the boundaries, but that's just here to the south. And Wesley Chapel is 100% within the 12-mile basin. I guess it might have a little piece. You're right. Yeah. Could be. Yep. All right. So now the more numerous ones. Uh, so this is looking at Henby Ridge, Indian Trail, Lake Park, and Stallings. Uh, this is spread across four different basins, and I want to distinguish between two of them before we drill down too much. You see there's two 12-mile columns. So the first 12-mile is that bulky or large 12-mile basin that we've been looking at. And then there's Poplin. Uh, Poplin, as flows today, goes to 12-mile, so it's still considered part of the 12-mile basin. But we're treating it separately. If you were ever to build a treatment plant on the end of Poplin, that would become its own separate basin. And the, the reason for that is just Poplin is served by a pump station, so it's just where you send it. So for purposes of what we're showing you, we treat these separately, but for right now, it all goes to 12 mile. So even though they're separate, that's just an important thing to point out. Um, so uh, this is just showing you what the spreads are uh, between all of these, and then we have the, uh, the, the totals. So nothing too remarkable here other than Crooked Creek has a pretty even spread of Indian Trail Lake Park installings. All right, so I'm going to show you two different statistics. Uh, so the first one that we're going to look at is the percent of that tributary area that is consumed by the town. So what this means is that so for each of these sewer basins, all of this adds up to 100%. So for example, Crooked Creek, 63% of the Crooked Creek area is Indian Trail. 14% uh, of it is unincorporated. So this is showing you the statistics of, you know, what portion of the basins are made up by the towns. Um, going over six mile just has three constituents. You've got Marvin Weddington and unincorporated areas. And then 12 mile probably has the most, uh, where 12 mile touches most towns except Pemby Ridge and Lake Park. And then 12 mile Poplin uh, on the same. So this shows you the data in terms of how much the towns make up of each treatment plant. Jay, Switch. go back to that one a minute. Sure. So, land uh, area, right, Jay? Land area yes, correct. Land area, not flood. Correct. Sort of lost my train of thought, but this basically says how the sewer is allocated up, isn't it? It could be, but to Brian's point, um, they may not contribute proportionally to their area, so that the the Sewer know, contribution might not exactly match the I know what my main point was. Mm -hmm. it, let's say like Indian Trail annexes some property, then that means the 14 would go down and the 63 would go up. Correct. Correct. Okay. And this is all within their town limit footprint. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the second piece of data is just looking at slightly different. This is going to show you the percent of the towns that are tributary to each treatment plant. So we've already looked at this in summary. Uh, so for example, Mineral Springs is 100% within 12 mile. Um, Marvin is split up between 6 mile and 12 miles. So it's showing you kind of the same relationships just differently um, as, the, as the previous slide. All right. Uh, so for next steps, um, the this was more of a preview for you guys on the sewer service area boundaries, uh, but this will be uh, up for you guys to vote on and approve. I believe this is the May 16th, May 16th meeting. Um, so uh, we'd like to get you know any comments. You have anything you might want more information on or drill down into, so we can have that for you by then. And what we do with this is this is the basis of sewer planning. So if it's within these basins, we will consider it as part of the master plan. If it's outside of these basins, it's, it's not, is, is the, kind of the short way to, to say that. So uh, that's it. Any, any questions, anything you guys want to drill into? Any questions? So just 
just want to point out, as, uh, as Jay mentioned, on May 16th, you will have both a map for the sewer service areas as well as an ordinance, which goes along with that. Those two will be advertised for public hearing, and then the board can take action that day if you wish. And I'm assuming that the capacities that you recommend will be based on <coughs> current zoning. So you're talking about um, with the master plan? The master plan so that shows us how much capacity we'll need in each. So they're doing a capacity analysis. My understanding is they've contacted each municipality about their plans. So not necessarily current zoning, but what their plans are. Now, obviously, the board has to adopt what you feel is appropriate, but they've taken into consideration what the towns have planned for in their communities. But if we figure on what's there now, current zoning, and they change the zoning, then the demand's going to go up. Well, hopefully that's captured in their planning efforts. So the, so the way that... The way the projections work is, and this is, I think we presented this a couple months ago, is the comp plan is the basis countywide, and then we talk to these towns about their planning, as Brian mentioned, and where there's a difference, we would raise the number up for the town so that it matched their planning explicitly. And will your plan be able to take the flows from those areas and flow it through the system and tell us if a pump station has to be upside. Yes. yes, sir. That's what the capacity analysis, the next time you see me, will be to talk about that specific thing. So we'll know if, if this area in X town gets so much capacity, you're going to have to upgrade this pump station, and will the line that's in the ground now be able to cover it? Correct. That's a lot of information, Jay. I figure y'all like seeing me, right? So. <laughs> Okay. It might be two meetings or it might be a long meeting. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. I don't have any questions, but I do uh, have a comment. I'd just like to um, emphasize how important um, what we're about to do is in defining service areas. This is huge for the county. Um, right now, we basically don't have um, de jure defined service areas in our county ordinances and that poses a lot of problems it poses problems in terms of planning it, to it poses problems in planning planning for capacity planning for cost um, it uh, poses problems in terms of um, committing and embracing uh, capital uh, projects spending on growing and improving our infrastructure when our citizens don't know where the next next development might be might be served because right now it might be served anywhere and it might be served by a pump station that's subsidized by all of the ratepayers so by defining well in our county ordinance by reference our uh, sewer service areas um, folks will be able to have some confidence and where the patterns of development will happen. And largely they'll happen where there's existing sewer infrastructure, where the areas that are adjacent to that infrastructure are uh, served naturally by gravity. Um, if something um, uh, is outside of that service area, it can be amended. This isn't written in stone, but it has to get approved by a majority of the Board of County Commissioners. So I hope everyone appreciates just how important this step is and how I think it's going to lead to greater confidence in the decisions that this board makes, greater confidence in terms of where sewer gets extended, greater confidence in terms of spending on capital projects, because we'll have a better sense of where the development patterns are going to be and where they're not going to be. And you know, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Jay, just uh, flipping back to uh, the original um, map um, that excludes you know, I think Unionville and Fairview and uh, some of the areas outside of the current kind of de facto um, areas that are served, uh, draft proposed sewer service area. Yeah. Um, I would encourage folks to just spend some time, you know, on this picture right here. Uh, it gives me a lot of confidence. And that's what we would need right now because we've got some big decisions ahead of us in terms of managing capacity, growing capacity, embracing, committing to some capital projects. 
Um, but without the political will to do it, it may not happen. And this is what's going to help, uh, I think, allow for and create that political will because this gives us some confidence if we can define those service areas. Thank you very much. He speaks so eloquently. Good. All right, thank you. Okay. Next, 22285. Am I right there, Brian? CIP program review. Okay, I didn't see John. He was behind uh, behind Jay. Yep, 20, Unit 20, County 20, Water CIP projects update. Yes, sir. Recognize John Shutak. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Today I'll be talking uh, a little bit about our CIP program. Um, just giving a brief overview of uh, completed projects, current projects, future projects, and then some decisions we're going to need to make in the future. So uh, please keep in mind uh, what I'm going over here is just a sampling of projects. Uh, so. Out of all the stuff we've done, I've picked out some we've completed, picked out some of the things that we're working on, generally major projects, but if there's anything in here that I don't cover that you'd like some information on, please reach out. We'd be happy to uh, fill in the gaps for you. So jumping right into things, and hopefully my fingers work today. Uh, what have we done on the water side? Completed projects. So we completed the Wingate Elevated Tank, uh, expansion at the reservoir or at the uh, Catawba Water Treatment Plant, both the reservoir and the capacity increment increasement, increase, uh, as well as year one of the short line backlog. All in, you're looking at about $45 million of investment in the water system. And the Wingate Tank, uh, first project on our list, you can see it's located uh, just south of the Monroe Bypass there off Old Williams Road. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the finished product there in the upper right of the slide. Uh, one of the interesting things about this project is it's what's called a composite tank. So you've got a, a concrete uh, structure for it and then a steel bowl. Uh, when this is constructed, that concrete column is erected first and then the steel bowl is actually assembled and painted on the ground and then lifted into place. Uh, so I've got a short video here, hopefully it works. You can see it's raised up and then fixed, you, know, you can see at the top of the tower there, there's a ring, that's the anchoring ring, so that's where it's permanently attached. But this is roughly a days long process to lift that bowl in place. Uh, so just neat little fun fact for you on water tank construction, because I know you're all very interested in that. Um, Next project out at the uh, uh, water treatment plant that we share with Lancaster, uh, we completed the construction of a billion gallon reservoir project out there. And in the foreground of the picture here, you can see the river uh, moving up uh, on that picture. You see the earthen embankment and then the impoundment area where that billion gallons of water is stored. Uh, kind of in the uh, lower left of the picture, you can see the bridge that goes out for the pump station. I believe all of you have been out there uh, for the ribbon cutting ceremony for this project. Uh, off on the left of that picture, you can see the original reservoir, which for reference, that's about 100 million gallons. So this new one is roughly 10 times the volume. Uh, and this is really a re uh, redundancy and reliability project. So it allows for roughly 30 days of operation under current demand, uh, should we be unable to withdraw water from the river for any reason, uh, whether that be drought or an environmental concern or what have you. Uh, one other thing to note, you can see uh, the treatment facility there in, in the left-hand side of the, the photo, and you can see a lot of that area is stripped bare. Uh, that's the water treatment plant expansion that was starting basically just as we got done with the, the reservoir expansion. 
and that expanded the capacity increment from 36 to 40 MGD. Uh, this included improvements uh, through the existing treatment process <coughs> train. Uh, so we went through and retrofitted, upfitted uh, the, the existing facility, uh, removed any hydraulic constrictions uh, to allow better flow through the plant, in addition to adding uh, a membrane filtration facility right in between those two, uh, basically the north and south half of the plant. So made very efficient use of the footprint out there. Um, this overall was about a $9 million investment in the facility uh, to get us to that 40 MGD capacity increment. And then last on the, the project list is year one of the backlog for the short line program. Uh, we put about eight miles of pipe in the ground serving uh, just over 100 applicants. Uh, this was comprised of four phases. We started out with Pinewood Forest, and then we had phases two, three, and four, generally north, south, and west portions of the county packaged those projects together. Um, <coughs> kind of a, a, a nice side to this uh, project was we had budgeted $5 million a year, and this work was actually done for about $3.6, $3.7 million. <coughs> so positive news on the budget side, which is kind of hard to come by in the current environment. On the wastewater side, looking at some of the projects that we've done, uh, we have the capacity increment uh, increase out at the 12 Mile Creek facility, uh, improvements to that collection system with the Blythe Creek interceptor improvements, and then in the Crooked Creek Basin, we completed the headworks improvements at the treatment facility there, as well as replacement of the Forest Park pump station and upsizing of, some of the uh, tributary interceptors. All told, you're looking at about a $60 million investment in, in the wastewater system across these four projects. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, the 12 Mile Creek expansion, uh, this again increased the capacity increment from seven or from six to seven and a half MGD, uh, and that included improvements from the influent screening process all the way through uh, the grit aeration, uh, solids handling, uh, and, and disinfection processes. Uh, as well as all the ancillary improvements that are required as far as mechanical, electrical, and controls improvements, just to make sure everything works as it's intended to. Uh, this represented a total cost of about $41 million as an investment to the facility, and that was, again, for that 1.5 MGD uh, expansion increment. Out in the collection system, the Blythe Creek Interceptor, this was a project that was done as a long-term solution to provide service to the Waxhaw and Wasaki neighborhoods, uh, generally uh, in the downtown Waxhaw area, as you can see there, circled in blue. The uh, project put in uh, just over three miles of gravity interceptor piping, and the benefits here uh, really were to, one, remove 18 pump stations from service. So a number of these homes were served by grinder pumps. Uh, so you'd have two or three homes that were connected to a single pump system. Uh, and those all pushed over to the west side of Broom Street. Uh, and that flow went through the existing collection system in downtown Waxhaw. So not only did we take the pump stations offline, but we also took that flow off of the downtown system. Uh, the downtown system there it does have a capacity constraint. So alleviating flow from that was a benefit of this project as well. And this was about uh, roughly a $5.3 million investment in the collection system there. Sorry for the slide skips. Uh, in the Crooked Creek Basin, uh, out of the facility there, uh, treatment facility there, we completed uh, the Headworks Improvement Project. And this really focused on replacing aging infrastructure and allowing us to better control or manage wet weather flows. So this involved uh, construction of a new influent pump station, uh, which also includes the provision for future, uh, future diversion pumping, if uh, that's something that uh, we choose to do, uh, as well as the construction of a 3 million gallon uh, equalization tank to handle those wet weather flows. Flows can be diverted to that tank during wet weather events, and then slowly released back into the treatment plant uh, so you're not overwhelming the facility. Also included improvements to the, uh, the headworks and then all the ancillary uh, electrical and controls improvements there. Uh, again, about a $9 million investment in the facility. Uh, in the Crooked Creek collection system, we replaced the Forest Park pump station. This was upsized to a total capacity of 1.6 MGD. Uh, and we also replaced roughly three quarters of a mile of interceptor 
uh, so that flow could be adequately carried <coughs> present and future demands to that, that pump station. Oops. On the R and R side, uh, so I'm going through these kind of in three buckets: water, wastewater, and, and rehab and replacement. Uh, on the R and R side, uh, we've we've rehabbed uh, a couple of our existing uh, elevated storage facilities, uh, as well as completed some I and I work uh, in the Old Sycamore and Tallwood service areas. So you saw earlier how a tank's constructed. Uh, when you have to rehab it, it's obviously a little bit different process. Uh, you start out with the existing facility in whatever condition it may be in. The first thing you got to do if you're going to paint it is you have to clean it. So you see folks scaling up and down, uh, pressure washing the outside of the tank. Um, and then you have to prep the surface for paint. Uh, so the first thing they do is tent the, uh, the tank and then they sandblast it. So obviously they tent it so they're not spraying the blast media all over everything that's around it. Uh, then after a lot of work, uh, a, basically a three-part system is applied. You've got a primer, two finish coats, uh, and then any decorative work that you may have. In this case, it's the Town of Stallings logo that was put on the tank. So similarly, we rehab the Highway 218 tank. Again, the existing tank. Got to set up and, and sandblast it, get that ready for paint. And in this instance, you can see we've got the Union County logo on it. It was applied in two directions, so if you're traveling east or west on Highway 218, you get a view of that logo. And then I and I abatement, as I mentioned, uh, in the Tallwood and Old Sycamore basins, these are served by package plants, so they're fairly discrete service areas. Total, you've got about 10 miles of collection system piping and about 250, 260 manholes. All of that piping's been inspected, all those manholes inspected, the repairs identified and completed. So that brings me to what we're presently working on. So on the water side of things, we're looking at phase one of the transmission mains in the 853 zone, interconnects with Charlotte Water, uh, the Yadkin Regional Water Supply Project, and then year two of the short line backlog. So phase one of the 853 transmission main project is, uh, generally speaking, uh, about four to five miles of pipe along Rocky River Road and Seacrest Shortcut. Uh, it's 36 inch on Rocky River uh, from, uh, uh, excuse me, from, <coughs> excuse me, from Price Shortcut Road up Rocky River to Seacrest Shortcut Road, uh, and then on Seacrest Shortcut from Rocky River up to Haywood. Uh, presently under construction, uh, an investment in the system of about $21 million for construction. Interconnects with Charlotte Water. Uh, we started these uh, a number of years ago, uh, established the first interconnect uh, with, for the 935 zone. Uh, that was put in uh, relatively quickly, uh, and we did have some things that we needed to change with that uh, to meet Charlotte Water standards. So those have been included with the interconnect with uh, the 880 project. Uh, this involves about 1,400 feet of piping. Uh, as well as metering and backflow uh, so that in uh, emergency situations we can accept flow from Charlotte water. So it gives us a redundancy should we have an event where we could not supply water to either the 935 zone or the 880 zone. Now a uh, perfect example of this is when we rehab that Stallings tank. Uh, that tank is what supplies pressure to the 935 zone. So we were able to take the tank offline use that interconnect with Charlotte Water to supply that zone so our, our customers never had an interruption in service or a decrease in the level of service. Uh, I would point you uh, or direct you to the, uh, the numbers that are on the, the, the image there. You see the 960 zone for Charlotte Water and then the 935 and 880 zone. 960, uh, 935 and 880 are the, the uh, service gradients or elevations uh, that, that service is provided at. With Charlotte water being higher, the only way the water can move is from Charlotte to Union County. So normal operation, we're supplying water to the, the two pressure zones, 935 and 880. If there's a situation where we can't, then water would feed from Charlotte to those zones. Can I ask you a question before you go? Certainly. Uh, the previous slide where you talked about Rocky River Road where the Yadkin was tied in. Yes, sir. There. Uh, my understanding is they're tied together 
for redundancy and backup between the Catawba and the Yadkin. That is correct. And so if we lose it, we've lost the Catawba a couple times. That's why we had to go to the larger basin, the larger lake to hold it. It gives us 30 days. <clears throat> but if we lose it completely, this will allow us to run the entire county with the Yadkin waters. That's my understanding. Yes, this 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 particular project uh, establishes the link between our existing system, which runs up to the Watkins booster pump station right there at Price Shortcut, uh, and the Yadkin plant with the finished water transmission main coming over to Rocky River and Seacrest Shortcut. This 36-inch piece is that highway between the two plants. It, it's the final connecting piece, or the I don't know the golden spike. Uh, so to speak. The point I'm making is that the Yadkin water is not for the West. No, sir. That the Catawba takes care of that. But that this is, is this allows us redundancy. If we lose either one of them, we'll be able to service the yes. entire county. That's exactly right. And that's good planning. Thank you. And John, in fourth quarter when we lost Anson, we furnished that shortfall with Catawba, right? That is correct. We have the ability to feed that area with Catawba water. And, and interbasin transfers don't matter when there's an emergency situation. Uh, we were able to put Catawba water there to fill the need. You can. We still need to report on the interbasin transfer. Um, however, yes, in an emergency, generally speaking, you can say all bets are off. You do have to go back and do a post-mortem on it. I understand that, but otherwise those people would have been without water unless we could have meandered it down from Charlotte. That is correct. Okay. Commissioner Russian. If you would go back one slide. Has that been built now? It's under construction now. So it's not built now? It's not completed? No, it is not complete. How are we supplying water to the Rocky River sub-basin? Through existing pipes? Well, generally speaking, we're, we're supplying water in the Yadkin Basin either through our Anson supply or it's backfed uh, with Catawba water. No, I think, I think what they're asking is that uh, that Anson County supply, when it was gone, how are we supplying that water now? That comes from the Catawba treatment facility. Right. Thank you. So we've all talked about the Yadkin Regional Water Supply Project. It's kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the room as far as projects. Um, this one's got a construction cost on it of about $277 million. Uh, overall program includes the intake and pump station on Lake Tillery, the raw water transmission main to bring the water to Union County, the 12 MGD water treatment facility, and the finished water transmission main. Uh, as we've talked about, that north-south kind of dotted pink line, that's the future east side transmission or 762 zone transmission main that will be uh, constructed as a separate project. Yes, sir. John, would you repeat what you just said? I know uh, when this started, I learned <coughs> what GMP, guaranteed maximum price. But did you just say maybe through good luck and value engineering that it's right now it's at 276? The construction cost is about $277 million. Overall program cost, which I've shared with you before, so that includes the IBT permitting effort, our program management. Overall, the program cost is about $303, $304 million. Okay. And then we've got our, our short line, the year two backlog. Uh, that is presently underway. Uh, installing uh, just under uh, five miles of pipe here, or excuse me, just under six miles of pipe, uh, and providing service to uh, roughly 52 applicants, uh, have this broken out in three phases. John. Yes, sir. On the one slide back on Yadkin, we're at what percentage complete on that project today, and, and when do you expect that to come online? What's the projected? Uh, turn on. Okay. <laughs> Great question. We're about 50%, maybe a little bit more uh, complete on construction at this point. Um, the plant uh, will basically 
crank the ignition key on that in July, August of next year, uh, with final completion of the project coming in November of 2023. So presently we're 16 months out from getting things started up. It'll so be exciting. July, August, you start operating the plant, you work all the bugs out, flush the system, Correct. all of those kinds of things, and then November, you turn the valve on and start flowing water. Water will start flowing before then, but okay. final completion on the project. Okay. So when the, you know, the contractor's all gotcha. said and done, that, that's November. Okay. Very, very uh, there, there's some additional work out of the raw water project that has to happen <coughs> in the lake. Uh, and that can't happen until after September, mid-September. Because so, we can only work in the lake during certain times of the year. Yes, we can't disturb the fishies. Right. So uh, we have, have to be out there after, uh, I believe, the cutoffs mid-September. Uh, it'll take them a couple of months to wrap that up. Okay. All right. On the wastewater side of things, uh, presently we have the uh, interceptor improvements in the West Fork 12 Mile Creek. Uh, improvements to the Waxhaw sewer system, and we have the Poplin Road pump station interim improvements. Uh, looking at about a total of $30 million in ongoing projects here. Uh, first project, the West Fork 12 mile interceptor improvements. This includes uh, just over five miles of piping, ranging in size from eight to 24 inch, uh, generally running uh, along the West Fork Creek. Uh, from Weddington Road up to the Brookhaven pump station. Uh, one of the main uh, features of this project is we're taking three pump stations offline. And as a result, we're offloading a, a lot of flow from the East Fork interceptors. Why is that important? That's because we're, that's where our Poplin Road force main discharges. So in order for that to keep pumping back over as it does presently today, we need to make sure that that interceptor's got capacity. So this is providing that relief to ensure that continued, continued operation as well as providing uh, demand for present and future uh, development. Oops. The Waxhaw sewer improvements, this map may look a little bit familiar because we talked about the Blythe Creek uh, interceptor improvements, and this is a good example of how capital projects kind of build on one another. So we completed the Blythe Creek interceptor project, which is over on the, uh, the right-hand side of this, this graphic here, and now we've got the Waxhaw sewer improvements. Now, if you recall, this was the outcome of the uh, Waxhaw master plan assessment. So we looked at capacity within the town of Waxhaw, and this was found to be the most efficient way to uh, alleviate the capacity constraints. And what this does is it extends the gravity system and relocates an existing pump station. So we're getting a, a brand new pumping, uh, pump station facility with better access off Roan Branch Road, uh, and we're directing the flow, not through downtown Waxhaw, but to the new Blythe Creek Interceptor, which it was sized for. Uh, this is about a $5.3 million investment in the system uh, and looking at completion later this year. The last project I've got is the uh, Poplin Road Pump Station, the interim improvements. Uh, and this, uh, as, as you all know, um, involves interim improvements to the Poplin Road pump station, uh, including an equalization facility which allows us to manage those wet weather flows so we can divert the high flows to the tank and then bleed them back into the system after the event is passed in order to mitigate any uh, downstream uh, overflows or capacity constraints. So we've also got the, uh, the pumping improvements, uh, transfer pumping improvements at the facility itself as well as the conveyance piping to move that flow to the tank and return it to the system. Um, obviously, we have, we have other electrical and, and controls improvements to make sure the system works as it should, and this represents about a $13.4 million investment in the collection system. <coughs> so on the R&R side, we've got a number of projects underway, including SCADA, which is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Uh, Transition of our system from uh, an advanced or from an automated meter reading system to an advanced metering infrastructure setup. Uh, we'll be rehabbing uh, the Marshville tank. Uh, we've got <coughs> rehab work going on at the old Sycamore 
reclamation facility and Crooked Creek reclamation facilities, as well as work uh, to retire the septic tank and effluent gravity or STEG system uh, from service. Uh, you can see we, we've got significant dollars invested uh, in these various programs. On the SCADA side of things, this involves uh, replacing, a, replacing computer networks, uh, putting in place new human machine interface software, HMI systems, uh, and replacing our communications or telemetry system. This, this system is what allows us to see and operate our system from remote locations. So data comes in from pump stations, booster pump stations, water tanks, to a centralized location such as the government center or the operations center, and that data is visualized through the HMI software. So it tells the operator what's happening in the system. Uh, telemetry or communications is what allows that data to go from the remote facility to the centralized location. Uh, presently, we've completed the network systems installation, and it's in its uh, demonstration phase right now. Uh, so our next phase will be to install that HMI software so that data it's collecting can be visualized. Uh, and then later this summer, we're going to be advertising for the telemetry and the remote site equipment replacement. So making a lot of progress on that. Moving our uh, meter system from an AMR or an automated meter read to an AMI or advanced metering infrastructure system. What this is is, is basically retrofitting or replacing our meters so that uh, instead of somebody driving by in a truck collecting reads, this is collected through a network of communications equipment and sent back to a basically a cloud-based uh, network system which allows customers and Union County staff to see usage in virtually a real-time basis. So end result is a, a much greater, in, uh, a great enhancement to our customer service. Allows people to view and control their usage uh, on a much more discreet level. Be rehabbing the Marshville tank. So this is going to involve uh, repairs to the access and safety systems. Uh, so any ladders, hatches, anchoring points for climbing equipment, all of those will be repaired, as well as cleaning, priming, and, and finished painting of the exterior and interior surfaces. Uh, we're also installing an altitude valve as part of this project. So that allows the, the uh, operation of the tank to be automated uh, rather than a manual process. Presently, we've got uh, work underway out at the old Sycamore plant. And uh, as you can see from the overhead picture here, uh, these treatment trains are metal. Uh, so they're structural steel. And due to the corrosive nature of wastewater, every once in a while you have to get in there, drain out the uh, one side of the treatment train, inspect it, clean it, recoat it. Uh, and that's what's presently ongoing right now. Uh, as part of that, any anything beyond the normal scope of work that's identified, you know, you uncover something uh, that needs to be replaced, we're taking care of that with this project. It's about a $1.4 million investment in the, uh, in the facility, and it also includes the replacement of the existing generator and the automatic transfer switch. So in the event that line power or utility power is lost, there's that seamless transition to generator power so the facility never loses operation. Similarly, uh, we've got a, a very similar project out at the Crooked Creek plant. Um, rehab uh, along the, rehab within the, the primary and secondary treatment systems, so the aeration tanks uh, and clarification systems, as well as electrical improvements. Uh, so we're replacing some switch gear, uh, motor control centers, power panels. These things have just reached the end of their useful life and they need to be replaced. Uh, and similarly to the old Sycamore plant, we're replacing the generator and the automatic transfer switch in order to ensure seamless operation in the event power is lost. And then our STEG uh, system replacement. So this is a system that was put in. Uh, it relies on a septic tank at the point of use, so whether it's a house or a business. Uh, connects to a septic tank and then it's four inch collection system piping, so it only handles the, the water, not the solids. Uh, this system is prevalent throughout uh, neighborhoods in Indian Trail and Stallings, as well as Waxhaw. So over the next 10 years, uh, we've got about a $19 million investment to 
take these septic tanks out of service and replace that four inch system with your more standard eight inch system uh, of piping. And as you can see, this is generally bounded between 74 and Old Monroe Road uh, from Indian Trail Road up to about the county line. Uh, and then in the Waxhaw area, you can see it's generally west of Broome Street, uh, kind of north and south of, of Highway 75. So work's going to be ongoing in that system uh, out through, <coughs> excuse me, 2030 is what we have it planned through. John, can I stop you there? We Certainly. were scheduled, it's 2 o'clock, we were scheduled to take a little 10-minute recess at 2.15, and if it pleases the board, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and take that 10 minutes now instead of at 2.15 <coughs> for 10 minutes. So we'll readjourn at 2.10. That's fine with me.
can go ahead. It's your pleasure. You actually picked a very good spot to stop. Um, I just wrapped up with um, with what we are presently doing. Uh, so going forward, this is what the plan uh, is for what we are going to do uh, across the water, wastewater, and uh, the R and R segments of our our capital plan. So on the water projects, uh, we've got future phases of the 853 transmission main. Uh, we'll have a new elevated storage uh, facility uh, in the Indian Trail area, and we'll be constructing that 762 or east side transmission main. Uh, and note that this is proposed to be funded uh, out of the uh, state budget ARPA earmark uh, for the Yadkin program. Um, and note that uh, with the 853 transmission main improvements, a, a good segment of this is going to be constructed in concert with uh, the NCDOT improvement project to widen Old Monroe Road. Uh, we also have our annual programs for the, uh, the short line and then extending uh, water throughout the county. So jumping right in, uh, future phases of the 853 transmission main, these are all comprised of 16 inch transmission main piping. Uh, you can see in red uh, over on uh, Seacrest Shortcut Road, that's phase two. Uh, that'll go from Hayward up to Unionville Indian Trail Road. Uh, the segment in purple uh, off on the left, that's on Waxhaw Indian Trail Road, about 17,000 feet of piping. And then you've got uh, kind of that orange, green, and, and light blue color going down Old Monroe Road. These will be constructed uh, with DOT projects. Um, the only downside to that is uh, uh, we're subject to their schedule. Uh, so depending on what happens with the state budget and timing of those projects, that'll influence when these improvements are actually constructed. Planning on a new elevated storage facility within uh, town limits of Indian Trail. Uh, presently, this is planned uh, to go on a, a parcel the county owns just south of Brandon Oaks uh, and Old Monroe Road. Uh, however, we are looking at, uh, number one, the, the sizing, uh, so that two million gallons uh, could change, uh, as well as the location as part of the, the master planning process with Brown and Caldwell. So this uh, project subject to change pending further information later this year. Uh, our east side transmission main, uh, this includes 24-inch uh, piping from the Yadkin water treatment plant, uh, generally going south along McIntyre, Lawyers Road, and Mills Harris Road, down towards the Marshville Wingate area and Highway 74. Uh, about eight miles of piping or so. Uh, and as part of the ARPA request, we have requested uh, to include a parallel distribution line with that. So there'd be an eight inch line constructed generally from uh, Lawyers and McIntyre <coughs> along Lawyers Road and then continuing south on Mills Harris uh, down to Monroe Ansonville Road. So there would be availability for existing residents and future uh, currently undeveloped parcels to connect to should they so choose. On the wastewater side, we've got uh, the expansion out of 12 mile from seven and a half to nine MGD planned. Uh, we have uh, additional phases of interceptor improvements within the Crooked Creek Basin, as well as an expansion to the Grassy Branch uh, treatment facility. The 12 mile expansion will take us from seven and a half to nine MGD. It'll include improvements for the influent pump station. Uh, we'll be adding equipment uh, in the blower building as well as uh, improvements in uh, the disinfection, filtration, and discharge systems, uh, as well as all the related electrical and controls improvements. In the Crooked Creek Basin, we're looking at uh, th three phases of interceptor improvements, and one of the phases, uh, phase three, is dedicated towards inflow and infiltration abatement, or INI abatement. Uh, so all told, this is about 26,000 feet or just over five miles of pipe uh, that we'll be putting in the ground to ensure that wastewater is conveyed from the collection system back to the treatment plant, uh, ensures adequate capacity for current and future demands. Um, all told, including the INI abatement, this is about a $37 million investment in the collection system. And then we've got the Grassy Branch plant expansion. Uh, as, as you all know, we've got a consent order with the state on this one. 
uh, and this is just bringing the, the treatment capacity of the plant in line with what it's actually seeing. Uh, so it's presently at about 50,000 gallons is the, the rated capacity. We'll be adding a second treatment train uh, to include an additional 70,000 gallons, bringing it up to a total of 120,000 gallons of treatment capacity on a daily basis. And this will allow it to continue to serve the neighborhoods and the school systems that, it, that are currently connected to it. Will there be any allowed hookups to that, or is it just to serve what we already serve better? There is an allowance for some, uh, some additional connection, but it's, it's very limited. So it's, it's what's already proximate to the collection system. It, it doesn't include areas that are within uh, what you would consider the uh, topographical boundaries of the service area. It's just the parcels that are adjacent to the collection system. If I can, if I can add to that, if you recall the map that Brown and Caldwell put up, the, the service area for grassy branch is significantly smaller to the point where it's sort of limited to the existing customers. As John said, there are a couple of lots that are that are vacant, and so those are they'll be allowed to connect, but it's only one or two, I think, lots, and, the, and, the, and the, there'll be no other connections allowed after that. I was up in that area last week and stopped, saw something on the side of the road, got out and looked at it, and I saw one of the manholes right beside the grassy branch. So I thought that's got to be the gravity line going to the plant. Yeah. That it is. On the R&R &R side of things, uh, we will be uh, rehabbing the old Stallings tank, uh, which is the one directly across from the Atrium Health Facility uh, at Stallings Road in 74. Uh, we've got a significant investment in I&I &I abatement, so about $11 million over the next eight years. Uh, pump station rehab, so this is taking care of what we've got, uh, just making sure that those facilities operate efficiently. Uh, and continued uh, work on our septic tank effluent gravity or STEG system replacement. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and replace the SCADA system out at the Catawba River treatment plant. John, why is the old Stallings tank rehab on a wastewater project? This is the R&R &R side of things. Rehab Sorry. And rehab and replacement. You'll see the title says rehab and replacement. I think That's our water blue tank. Is wrong. Oh, oh, My blue header's head wrong. So it is a water tank, right? Yeah, it is a water tank. If Apologies, the header on the table is be an EQ tank, wouldn't it? I'm sorry? If it was wastewater, it'd be an EQ tank. That is correct. My apologies for the typographical error. Well, you want us to pay attention, don't you? You know, this way I know you are, and I thank you for that. So the old Stallings tank, it is a potable tank. Uh, so again, the, very similar to the Marshville tank rehab, so we'll be looking at the safety systems, ladders, uh, tie-off points, uh, any hatches, anything like that, making sure that those are up to current code, uh, and then we'll be cleaning, priming, and finish painting uh, the interior and exterior metal surfaces. Uh, I, &I abatement, um, as, as you all know, inflow is a, a direct connection of stormwater to the sanitary system. So we want to eliminate this wherever we can. Uh, definitely don't want stormwater coming into your wastewater treatment collection system. Uh, infiltration is just where the system leaks. So cracks in pipes, manholes, uh, missing cleanout covers, things like that. So we go into the system and we look at the, uh, look at the basin, uh, investigate what's there, identify the repairs that need to be made, and then execute those repairs. So we have a comprehensive approach to this. Uh, in the 12 mile and Crooked Creek basins, uh, we've got uh, roughly 500 miles of, of collection system piping, 13,000 manholes, so there's a lot to go and look at. So this is a systematic year over year approach. Uh, we have dedicated funding on an annual basis to go and, and repair uh, or investigate and repair. Uh, and last but not least, I'll wrap up with uh, future decisions that we'll need to make. On the, on the water side of things, uh, you know, we've got uh, the Yadkin project underway. Once that's online, uh, we're going to have to start thinking about the timing and the management of future expansions at the Catawba plant. 
who we partner with Lancaster on, so the, the expansions there need to be coordinated with their needs as well. Uh, we also need to coordinate that with planned expansions at the, at the Yadkin plant. If we're going to have redundancy, you don't want both plants under construction at the same time, not just from an operational standpoint, but from a fiscal perspective as well. On the wastewater side, uh, we need to better understand uh, how we're going to be managing capacity on the east side and our long-term relationship with the city of Monroe. Uh, 12 Mile, uh, we do have the uh, expansion project bringing us to 9 MGD. The facility is permitted to 12. Uh, the site is planned for 15. So we'll need to figure out when exactly we need to uh, approach the state about expanding that, perm that discharge permit up to the full 15 and starting that process so that we're uh, planning appropriately for the future. And then just our last bullet point here is Site B. So uh, what are we planning or are we planning for a future uh, wastewater facility? Any questions? Well, John, I've got to uh, go ahead, Commissioner Russian. You've already established, and but it's just good to say it, you know, Yadkin water will not go to the west. Is that, that is correct. correct? If you would say it, because it seems to be a big confusion. No, the Yadkin water treatment plant is intended to supply water to the Yadkin Basin. So we do I not can, build water lines or sewer collection lines and subdivisions. So if you, you can see on this graphic uh, that north-south kind of black and yellow line, that's the ridge line. That, on, the, on the west is Catawba, on the east is the Yadkin. So that water is intended to serve the eastern portion of the county. Okay, the next one. Union County Public Works does not spend one cent to put water lines or sewer lines into new subdivisions. True or false and elaborate. That is a correct statement. Developer driven projects are paid for by the developer. And they have to attach to us. We don't run to them either, do we? No, if offsite improvements are required, that's on their dime as well. And if their flow would over, over task a pump station, they'll also have to upgrade the pump station, correct? That is also a correct statement. Okay. Commissioner Russian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the questions I had about the almost $19 million going to replace septic tanks um, in Waxhaw and Indian mm. Trail and Stylings. Yes, sir. Why, why, are those re, why are those septic tanks needing to be replaced? So that system was put in in the 70s uh, with federal grant money uh, through the EPA is how I understand it. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, that involves a septic tank at the point of use and then it's four inch diameter collection system piping. So it's only meant to convey liquid not solid waste. So it's not like a typical residential sewer system which is eight inch diameter piping with manholes on it. So why are, you're asking why are we replacing that? Why are we taking that out of service? So over time that four inch system is one overloaded. Uh, so there, there's more flow going to it than it can handle. The septic tanks aren't necessarily maintained by the owners either. So you have, uh, I guess, washout, uh, it would be a good term, of solids into that system. So we have essentially inherited a, a maintenance problem. Uh, and the long-term solution is we're, we're not pulling the septic tanks out of the ground or anything, but as we go through, uh, we're replacing that gravity system. And then as the septic tanks uh, either fail or fill up or need to be uh, maintained in some way, we would then be making the permanent connection and bypassing that, se that septic tank. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so we're absolutely not putting in. This, these are not failed septic tanks. This is a failed system. John, let me say that, something. That's correct. It's a municipal system. Uh, uh, Commissioner Russian, it's a great question, and I agree with you. It was part, there was never a drain field for these septic tanks. 
the drain fill was a sewer plant, a sewer treatment plant. That's correct. And what they have to do, if you have one of these tanks, that if it quits flushing, they'll call Public Works and they'll go out there and pump it out because it's like a grease pit before the gray water goes into the line. And what John's talking about, sometimes it don't quit working, but the solids start getting in the four-inch line, and that's where you have a problem. Yeah, we've, we've had line failures where the, that pipe material transitions uh, going under roads where you're going from maybe a plastic material to a metal material. So I have a, um, in Brunswick County, they have like a grinder pump that we put on those tanks. So the waste goes into a tank, then it has a grinder pump that pushes it into a smaller line that pushes it into the system. Uh, nothing like that is going to work for that, right? No, sir. Yeah, it's not to, to liquefy it to make it go in. So these solids, they just sit there and, and we're having to replace it. So we're not doing any more of those systems. No. And, and that purple line that you have on this map, where does it go to? Where does it stop? Sorry, the, the east-west line running from the treatment plant? So the east to west line? Yes. And it goes to the west side of Monroe, correct? It ties in at the at the intersection of Rocky River and Seacrest Shortcut Road. Yeah, to service Indian Trails, Stylings, those areas. It services and, the Yankee and Western Basin. Union County. Not Western. That that's not <laughs> Western Union County. I'm confused. It it services the Yadkin Basin, which is partially in Western Union County. Generally, the boundary line follows Old Monroe Road. Is is Stylings in Western Union County? I, yes. Okay. Indian Trail would be? Generally. The library we just built west. Okay. Thank you. John, go back to the service basins. Service basins. The one that shows where Indian Trail's cut in half. <coughs> I'm not sure where, where you want me to well, stop. Well, the whole thing. Okay, there's 74. And there is, now, anything that served that would be in the Yadkin Basin right now that doesn't go to Crooked Creek flows to Poplin Pump Station and goes back so that's one of those, it doesn't count against the inner basin when it comes from Catawba and goes back to 12 Mile. My point is, Stalins is cut in half. Part of Stalins goes to Crooked Creek. Yes. Part of Stalins goes to 12 Mile. Not all of Stalins, not all of Indian Trail. Is that not right? No, that, that is correct. You can see the, the municipal boundaries are can be split by that bridge line. And the only way that Catawba water can cross the inner basin line into Yadkin is if it drains back to 12 Mile Creek. Yes, we manage the IBT transfer of Catawba water into the Yadkin Basin by the return of wastewater flows from the Poplin Road pump station. So there is there is no yakking water that will go to the west that will not, if it goes to an area in the west, it will flow back to a treatment plant in the east that will keep that water in its basin. Thank you. I, I want to make sure that, that John understands the question. So any water that originates from Yadkin must be treated in the Yadkin Basin. Right. We do not have an interbasin transfer to send Yadkin water into Catawba and treat it in Catawba. So any water that originates in Yadkin must be treated in Yadkin. We do have an interbasin transfer with Catawba. That's where that flow can be treated and then sent back. Right. 
What what you were being asked was saying that the water went to the west, but it doesn't. Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You were being asked a question that would imply the water would go to the west, but it does not. The Yadkin water does not go to the west. No, the Yadkin water serves residents in the Yadkin Basin. Does that answer your question? Well, just, he's the man that can tell us. Uh, is Stallings in Western Indiana or Eastern Indiana? Both. Both. It's in, well, it's split. Any further questions I can answer? John, you are, you're amazing. And you've got where you talk louder so I can hear you. And, uh, well, thank you very much for your time. I don't have any questions, but I'd just like to say these kinds of engineering reviews uh, of what we've done, what we're doing, and where we're going, I find invaluable. Uh, and I definitely keep presentations like this at the ready, just personally. Uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity to especially thank Public Works engineering staff. I mean, I know um, you, are, you all are invaluable uh, to us in the county, and I know the board is asking especially a lot of you in the here and now. And I just want to say from this dais uh, how much I appreciate all of you. Well, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, we're going a lot faster than I, we had planned for, so we're going to have some time at the end. Uh, so hopefully it'll be a shorter meeting than what was originally planned. But I appreciate the time in front of all of you today to talk about things that are important to us. We're going to keep you here to four. <laughs> uh, from, well, if that's what you ask, if that's what you need me to do, I'm I picking, will stay here till four. I'm picking uh, that. I'll sing songs to myself or something while you all <laughs> go do other things. So um, from the master plan to the sewer boundaries, those are all important things to what John just showed you. It's important as well. And this last thing is really sort of pulls it all together sort of into how we operate as a, uh, a unit of the county, as an enterprise fund, as, as a business, and as in serving our customers. So before I really get started, I just want to introduce the folks that I work with every day and that keep your water utility running. So, and I, and I have a framework in my mind that I use, and so that's the order in which I'll do it, which is, so you've got Aubrey Lofton, who uh, is the planning and resource management uh, director. So she handles, in my mind, sort of long-term planning. Anything that's in the future, anything dealing with the IBT, she's handling that. Anything dealing with the technology that keeps this place going and working, she handles all of that, she and her staff. Uh, and then we go from her planning to John, uh, engineering, who you know, obviously you just heard from. He's the 10-year window. He's really, you know, what am I building in the next 10 years and how are we going to do that? <coughs> and so that's John Engineering. He also has all the new development working for him. And then so once John builds it, he hands it over to Andy, who then operates it. So all the wastewater treatment plants, uh, all the pipes, all the pumps, uh, all the buildings, all the facilities, all the maintenance, all the repairs, his folks are doing it. And so uh, once Andy gets done with it, then we hand it over to Amy. Uh, who's the business operations of it, and so she handles all the customer contacts, um, all the uh, billing that goes on, all the financial management, all the calculating of the revenue. And so, you know, I always used to think that uh, she was sort of the end of the circle. Uh, what she's informed me, and I think she's right, is that she's really in the middle of it. She's the hub. She handles all the customer contacts. She works with Andy's crews to go out and do repairs. Uh, she works with Aubrey <coughs> in the long-term plan. She works with John in terms of financing things. So uh, these are the people that are leading the utility. And between them and myself, I, easily there's 100 plus years of experience. And um, this is a great group of professionals that you have working for you and sort of managing uh, your utility. And so if that's your presence, I just want to point out two other individuals in the room. And so you got Zach, who works with, who's sitting right beside Amy. You also have Alex, who's sitting uh, right in front of Andy. That's your future for the utility. Um, you know, both of them have been here for less than three years, but they're excellent at what they do. And so uh, keeping 
hiring talented individuals and keeping them is obviously uh, uh, critical to well, any business, uh, especially in, uh, in these difficult times for recruiting. So there's your future right there. And I wanted to make a point of making sure that Alex and Zach both get mentioned today. So with that, um, I'm going to talk to you now. Yes, sir. Let me say something before we move forward. Okay. I've had the privilege of receiving utility service uh, with a new sewer tap and dealing with your operations staff and everything, your staff has been phenomenal. Uh, their expertise was very obvious. The dedication to quality work was <coughs> obvious. I watched, then I stood and watched them for two days installing that tap. They were very meticulous and uh, they should be commended. But uh, it's, uh, your staff does do a great job and I personally have observed it and benefited from it and I just wanted to say thank you for you moved on from this staff you have with you. Well thank you Commissioner Helms. I think you just commended Andy's staff and uh, Amy's staff today. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so when we you know obviously everyone's starting at the same place and that's really the vision statement for the county and the strategic objectives of the county. And so as we go through, you know we you know we the department, you know Union County Water, we think we hook into a lot of these uh, strategic objectives. Uh, we protect the public's health, uh, their safety and welfare, and making sure that we can provide clean, uh, safe drinking water. Uh, we think that we're an important part of uh, economic development in the sense that uh, we're providing the utilities that make business possible. And we also think about the environment, water conservation, and other things that try to, you know, we're trying to build a sustainable business model that in the long term is, um, you know, not just conserves the resources of the county, but also is an affordable resource uh, for the residents and the customers of Union County Water. Um, so in addition to that, you know, as, a, as an enterprise fund, we tried to go through and, and make sure that we have our own uh, vision for the, for the department that our employees can hook on to and that our customers can hook on to. And so it really is to do two things. It's to provide the safe, palatable drinking water that the community needs, and then to protect the environment to make sure that the residents of the county can have the quality of life that they, they desire. Uh, and so that's an important one for us. And so we, you know, we're trying to reflect the values of the county that the manager sets forth, and at the same time model you know, the values for our staff so that when they're out there meeting customers, uh, you know, we're not out there with them, they're out there working on their own, that they, can, um, they know how to treat our customers and know how to you know, perform their responsibilities uh, in a professional way. So in terms of our um, department, we've sort of gone through it. In addition to sort of the general administration, one of the functions that we do is health and safety. And that right now for, a, for this department that has 160-ish people and facilities and things all over the county, it is an army of one. And he did something this year uh, in the past 12 months that's never been done before. He visited, he laid eyes on every facility that we own to make sure that it was safe and where there were things that needed to be addressed, whether it was, you know, labeling of chemicals uh, or property, uh, he made sure that, you know, we went and went ahead and did those things to, so that we can provide a safe working environment for employees. Again, I talked about planning and resource management, sort of what they do, the water resource planning, the asset management, and I just want to make sure everyone understands what that means. When we talk about assets, we're talking about our pipes in the ground, our pipes and pumps. So when we're managing those assets, we're talking about how do we manage them on a life cycle so that we can make sure that we get to every mile of pipe uh, within a reasonable amount of time so that we can uh, make sure that it uh, doesn't fail. Uh, GIS, which is an important one, because uh, it shows our folks where to go, where the pipes are. It shows all the utilities where the pipes are and how we manage those things. And, and again, the system administration is support for all the uh, digital software that we use to manage the system. Um, Engineering, uh, new development, capital improvement, we, we've talked about and you're very familiar with. Uh, one of the things that we also do is construction management where we go and inspect the construction while it's underway to make sure that it's up to standard. Um, both our construction, those projects that John's talked about, as well as developer funded projects so that we have inspectors that do that. Do that. To be honest with you, that's a position that you funded in last year's budget. It has been impossible to fill. We've been out two or three times trying in, into the marketplace trying to fill that uh, and that's one of the challenges we have is this is a difficult marketplace to find construction personnel uh, and that's something we'll talk about later on. 
uh, business operations. They do the customer service contacts with all the all current um, uh, customers, future customers, anyone wanting to change service. Uh, the billing that is a you know a once a month billing cycle, and then the fiscal management, just managing all the revenue, all the costs, all the all the accounts. <coughs> Andy is so big uh, that he gets his own slide. Um, if we are about 150, 160 people, Andy is fully two thirds of it. And that's how many people we have, about 100, a little bit over 100, out in all these various locations doing uh, the work of maintaining uh, the system on a daily basis. So we, you know, Andy is the administration. There are maintenance folks that deal with all the lift stations, all the pump stations, all the water uh, treatment, uh, wastewater treatment facilities, uh, the transmission mains. We got field service crews that go out there to just maintain the systems on a daily basis. They do uh, line breaks, both on the sewer and the water side. We've got staff that operate uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, the two large wastewater treatment plants as well as the three package plants uh, and also doing all the industrial pretreatment program monitoring. Uh, we have uh, folks that do nothing but monitor the water system, the water that's flowing from Catawba into the pipes, flowing from Anson into the pipes and making sure that uh, it's uh, clean, safe, healthy drinking water. Um, the, a new unit that got set up is the uh, Yadkin operations and that is something that we're having to do because you don't just you know, build a plant, turn it on, you got to have people to operate it. And so Andy's starting to think about how exactly he's going to go about operating a new water treatment plant when it comes online in about 16 months. And lastly, it's something John talked about. Um, you know, he builds it and he replaces it and he upgrades it, but it's Andy's folks that are using it on a daily basis to making sure that the system operates the, the way it's meant to. And so for all that, we have about 158 uh, full-time employees and a little bit, almost one and a half uh, part-time employees managing our uh, utility, you know, doing the work of the utility on a daily basis. Uh, we are an enterprise fund, so we don't receive any federal money or state money um, or county money. Or, so there are no tax dollars that go into um, Union County Water. It is all what we call other revenue. And it's basically uh, funded by uh, the, the revenues that we get from our customers for the, what we bill for the water that they use and the sewer service that we provide and any other sort of related costs for taps and that sort of thing. But it's primarily the, the vast, vast, vast majority of our revenue comes from uh, water usage and sewer usage. Um, I'll point you down to the bottom where it says uh, $94.8 million for the other revenue. And you see a negative in there and you'll see some other things in there. And if you go all the way over to the right where it says adopted budget, it's $77.9 million in revenue. And so when I saw the agenda and I saw that last item, because you have one more after this about abolishing the district, uh, I will tell you that I personally am um, very excited to have, ha for you all to have that discussion, because I if I can speak for Beverly, we are both very excited that at the possibility that this might go away. Uh, because it's just, it's, it's one, very confusing, but it artificially inflates our budget because of all the transfer <coughs> between the district to the uh, county department and then from the county department to the district, depending on who can pay for what based on the way the uh, governing documents are written. So we're very excited by that and, and any support that we can provide to help you abolish the district, we would be happy to do. Um, in terms of how we measure uh, our business. Uh, it is a you know, growing business. It's a slowly growing business, but it's uh, st slow and steady. And we look at our customer interactions, and I will tell you, uh, with the sort of the onset of the pandemic, our level of interaction with our customers has dramatically increased. So in FY20, we did about 20, uh, 32,000 a year. Uh, in FY21, we did over 50,000 customer interactions, calls, emails, uh, callbacks, in, in person, um, it is a lot. You know, 32,000 per month to 51,000 per month. Uh, it, is a, it is a significant increase, and we didn't have any kind of increase in staffing levels at all. So you're just seeing everyone's workload uh, go up. Uh, accounts per mile, you're going to see that drop. Uh, in FY20, it was 31 um, accounts per mile. In FY21, it actually went down to about 24 accounts per mile. Um, the higher the number, more meters per mile, better off we are as a utility. It's because it just means more customers to spread the cost of um, the utility around. 
uh, water wastewater operations, um, you can see, again, you know, we're doing more with less. Uh, so as we have to do more, our cost per employee, um, our cost per mile in terms of maintaining employee, we just have less resources to, to do it and more miles to maintain. So when you do the math, it just breaks down to, you know, we're able to spend less money per mile. Um, water uh, employees per mile, we have uh, just a fractionally more employees per mile, and that's just overall just taking all the employees. Um, field service work, same sort of thing. Um, you know, it's, I just look at 20 and 21 is flat, you know, 240 to 241 uh, number of valves and hydrants per employee. Uh, when we look at new development workload, uh, which is another measure, uh, you can see that the number of reviews, uh, plan reviews and inspections that we have to do per employee in the new development group, uh, it's going up. Uh, in terms of recent accomplishments, I've, you know, there, I've actually created a slide per, per division to really talk through um, sort of what all they've done, and I just thought, well, that might be a lot. Uh, if there's anything on this list that uh, you're really interested in, I'm happy to talk to you more about it. We've talked about some of these things like AMI, so I don't really feel the need to talk about it again, but there are some things that are, that uh, sort of are under the radar that are not, uh, you know, sexy like a new wastewater, uh, wastewater plant or the Atkin water project, but that are worth mentioning. So I'm just going to pick out a few, if you don't mind, and tell you about why they're important and why it's what we would consider that an accomplishment. So that it's that first one, completed Lucidity work order system. So Lucidity is our digital work order system. Before, if you can imagine, we were trying to do everything by paper. So papers were handed out from customer service to Andy's group and they would go out to the field with paper to, oh, this is the, what I got to do right now. Nowadays, all they carry around is an iPad and so they get their work orders digitally and so they can, they can sign everything digitally, they can uh, provide updates to the work orders digitally. I've completed it, here, here's a picture of it. Uh, so they can do, so this, this was tremendous for us uh, and it's a, it's a big accomplishment and so you know, this is the foundation for all the other digital stuff that we are going to do. Uh, going on into the future. You know, those, all, those, all that information that's gathered in the field, put in Lucidity, becomes part of that permanent record yes, associated sir. with that account, associated with that valve, that pump. Yes, that is absolutely. Whatever it may be. Yes, sir. So the historical record of, you know, how often something needs to be maintenanced, how often something breaks, how often something has to be replaced, it's all in that system. It's all in there. Yes, sir. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about something else in a minute that sort of, to me, is very exciting. Uh, and I hope, I hope I can transfer some of that excitement to you as well. Um, so, you know, the first and second bullets are sort of tied together. So we, you know, our field crews are using uh, digital devices to manage their work versus paper. And it's just exactly what the manager said. So I don't think I, don't think I could have said it better than the manager, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, you know, an enterprise GIS license, so, you know, what you're starting to see is that we're moving a lot of this stuff to the cloud. You know, everyone talks about it, John even mentioned it, so we are moving to the cloud. And so a lot of the digitizing of our work allows us to, to do that. So when we look at the priorities on the 22 side, um, you know, obviously completing the wastewater and water master plan is an important thing, because it's our, basically our 10-year roadmap of what we're going to do the next uh, it's 10 years in terms of construction and then, you know, 20 years uh, if you're depending on your t horizon. Um, the third bullet down says design database warehouse. We've just called it the hub because this is, uh, and Aubrey gave me a great sort of metaphor to understand this. You know, all of our data right now is in silos. The customer data is in the silo. The work order data is in the silo. The GIS data is in the silo. And if you think of them as individual streams of data, what this uh, database warehouse is, it is the data, the digital lake that all of our <laughs> information is going to go into and it's all, they're all going to swim together so that when we pull the, put the tools in place, we're going to be able to pull data from that in a way that's really, really exciting to me, but we're going to be able to visualize it, we're going to be able to make it accessible to customers, uh, we're going to be able to make it accessible to you, the manager, whoever really wants to see it. It's not something we can do now, but, but it's our vision for the future. Uh, so when you see uh, down a little bit further, develop a customer portal, that's what we're talking about. That's the end state. We want to be able to provide uh, a customer a tool on their phone 
that they can figure, they can see in real time how much water they've used today or yesterday compared to last month, compared to last year. So uh, it really is exciting. If they want to make changes to their account, they should be able to do it on their phone uh, versus having to call in. Uh, so, so it really is an exciting development for us. And then the last thing I'll point to is this uh, Implement CAMS, which is a project management tool, and it's, that's for John's group. His group uses a very, I'll say, old project management tool to manage their capital projects, and this will just be a, just a generational upgrade. It'll make it so much easier for him to manage all of his projects and to see it and then to visualize it and then to see it on a map so that we could provide it to you on a map so if you wanted to see where the capital projects are happening you could do it instead of having to ask us for it on the water and wastewater operations um did i miss a slide prm no i guess i guess we're at it. yeah well water wastewater operations is next <coughs> um uh, you may, I'm sure you're all aware, but at some point, at one point, all the wastewater plants were operated by the City of Charlotte by contract. And then, you know, we, we took them over in the last couple of years, and Andy's standing up a wastewater group of seasoned, experienced, uh, quality professionals to manage those wastewater plants and to do it in the time that he did is, is a tremendous accomplishment because that group of individuals, you know, Bart Farmer is a superintendent under the, over there, I'd put them up against anybody. And they're that good, and Andy, you know, Andy takes credit for you know bringing all those people on board, uh, establishing um, you know a group to manage the SCADA system. Again, that is another pretty significant accomplishment. Putting together these hydrant maintenance programs, um, to, uh, and I know it doesn't seem as important, but on the second to last bullet, it says developing a hungry, humble, and smart program for interviewing, onboarding, and on-the-job training program for new employees. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is hire better. And so, uh, the, you know, Andy, working with HR, put together this program. And we're doing a better job interviewing and sort of filtering out and getting a, a better quality uh, candidate for the positions that we're hiring. So hopefully they'll stay and we won't have to, you know, you know during the probationary period, throw them back into the sort of the general pool. But that we can keep them, we can grow them, and we can turn them into water, wastewater professionals that'll spend a career here at Union County Water. In terms of 2020, uh, you know, he, Andy's building on that, uh, sort of how are we hiring people to then, well, how do we develop leaders in the organization uh, and developing a crew leader program so that we can just sort of naturally groom uh, our folks from, you know, entry level, staff, technician, through crew leader, through maybe other positions in leadership and management within the utility. And so, that, you know, that, that is, believe it or not, it's a really exciting development in terms of trying to, you know, grow our own staff. Um, the last thing I'll point to is the special order of consent. You know, Andy spent a great deal of time uh, trying to get that through the NCDEQ, and we did it successfully. And now it's just a matter of sort of implementing the agreement and making sure that we can uh, do everything that we committed to doing. On the engineering side, John's pretty much talked about uh, all the capital projects that, that sort of in review, so you could almost append that entire presentation to his recent accomplishments. Uh, what he didn't have a chance to really talk about is new development. And so uh, new development, you know, they've reviewed almost 4,600 plans in the last three years. That's about six, uh, 1,500 plus plans a year. And, and Crystal Panico, who leads that group, you know, she's not doing it with 100 people. She's doing it with five reviewers. And so uh, often these plans go, you know, they're reviewed, they get kicked back for edits. They get reviewed again, they get kicked back for more edits. So some of these plans take a great deal of time to actually make it through the whole review process. Uh, as part of that new development, you know, you know, they get permitted and they build the new the development, whatever that might be. And as part of that, we've accepted 39 miles of water infrastructure as a result of the new development program and 39 miles of wastewater infrastructure. It's to what the Chairman Rape said earlier. These are within development. So we don't build it. They build it and then they turn it over to us. And the value of that was about $35 million. Uh, the last thing I'll add, uh, say about new development, is we actually implemented during the pandemic a digital plan review process. So we had to buy new tools and technology for staff 
uh, and then just figure out the software and how we would work. But between the, uh, the submitters and, and our new development group, we're doing everything digitally. So that, that was a big, serious improvement uh, from how we were doing things before. Um, obviously, when we think about the priorities this year, the changes that you had wanted to the water and sewer ordinance as it relates to pumps and pumping, that was a big one. Um, we are monitoring the wastewater treatment capacity within our existing plants, I would say daily. Um, that's an important thing. And then as we, you know, as we implement these ordinance changes, you know, Crystal has to then sort of um, execute these sort of into the entire plan process so that everyone has a chance to uh, get familiar with it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, she, John's talked pretty much pretty significantly about capital, uh, so I won't uh, say much more other than, you know, they're doing, you know, they're building things and they're doing a great job doing it. Um, and it's a good group of engineers, John and Thomas, who sort of handles that group. Um, in terms of the overseeing the capital construction. Uh, business operations. Well, I will, uh, this is a good group of people. Uh, you got Amy, who is relatively new to her position, less than two years. You got Zach, who's new to his position. You got Jennifer, who's over customer service, new to her position. Um, so you got new leadership in that, in, in business operations. And that was the right thing to do. You also have, uh, new staff, both in the fiscal services group as well as the customer service group. You're going to have new staff in billing because of retirements and turnover. Um, and I'm really excited by the potential that Amy is bringing on board because she's also used the humble, hungry, and smart to identify and recruit and get a better sort of quality candidate into the pool. And so uh, we think they're going to do great things and we're starting to see that now but give them a year or two and I think they're going to be fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of work to do in terms of customer contacts and they're doing it. They're getting it done, um, but the workload is always increasing faster than, uh, than the staffing. So we'll just see what we can do to keep up. Uh, I will say one of the recent accomplishments is figuring out a way to do business with customers uh, during the pandemic, especially when the, when the governor's emergency order went out and we couldn't do any kind of uh, disconnects. And we had to keep track of all the money that we weren't able to collect, which was a significant amount, and then giving people uh, a chance to pay it back over time. And having we didn't have a system in place for that, and so having having them work it out on the fly in a very short amount of time, and trying to give grace to customers who were struggling, uh, and finding that balance, um, I would say that they did a fantastic job with that. Um, on the fiscal side, updating the rate models, and it's a very complicated rate model that, uh, well, most utilities have for running their business and trying to figure out what their costs are, what, what the revenue streams are, and then trying to find that right balance. Um, and so trying to update that is a, is a, is a difficult and challenging thing. Uh, we provided a rate model to you during the last rate increase, and, you know, we're going to uh, it's on the schedule for us to provide you another rate model in the coming months because uh, there are some important decisions to make. Uh, updating of the miscellaneous fees um, and, and having to do the reporting back to the uh, Utilities Commission on all the governor's executive orders are all, were all just fantastic accomplishments during a pandemic. Um, Priorities right now are really to recruit and train good staff so that we're in a position going forward uh, to successfully meet all of our customers' needs. And we, and we continue to do that. We continue to streamline our processes uh, and find ways to, to work and to do more with less. Uh, key initiatives, uh, planning and resource management, obviously completing the master plan is an important one. Uh, Starting the implementation for AMI, uh, and we're excited by what the possibilities of what that allows us to do. Uh, and then in conjunction, developing a customer portal. Uh, we've started looking at what that looks like, and we've, we're very excited by it. And at some point, we're going to give you a demo, because you're, you're the folks that we're going to have to convince that this is worth investing in. And, and I think you're going to be pleased by what you see. Um, new permit tracking capacity system. Uh, Again, as we're sort of looking at the limitations of how we can track uh, wastewater treatment capacity as it's tied to new development, we're finding the limitations of what we're using right now. And so this is a new uh, initiative to really try to find a better tool 
to help us manage uh, treatment capacity uh, better, more in a more refined, more detailed way. Uh, it says here organizational vis visualization. Really what that means is taking all this data in the data lake that we are going to have and finding a way to present it to uh, the, the stakeholders, uh, the board, the manager, customers in a way that makes sense to them that they can understand that really explains what's going on with the utility. On the engineering side, it's really implementing the capital plan and whatever the new capital plan that's going to come out of the master plan. Uh, that's an, obviously an ongoing thing. Managing new development is an ongoing thing. Uh, working with our municipal partners and our community uh, to provide water uh, as needed is an important thing. Uh, for Andy, um, really the thing, the thing that comes to mind right now is that he's got to staff up this wastewater, I'm sorry, this water treatment plant. It's, you know, if, if all the valves are ready to go, if everything's ready to flip the switch, somebody's got to run it on a day-to-day -day basis. And based on all the analysis, all the engineering analysis from the firms, it's going to take about 11 FTEs to run this thing uh, when, it, when we first uh, hit the start button. Uh, business operations, you know, just try, again, trying to find a way to run the business better. One of those things is called effective utility management. It is a program designed for utilities to find ways to uh, uh, emphasize, to find areas of emphasis and find ways to actually do better performance-wise in those areas. Um, trying to find, one of the things we want to do is actually try to find, you know, a new level of customer service. What level of customer service are we currently providing and can we do better? And what does better look like for our customers? Um, second half of the system development, uh, well, we got to update the system development fees, so you will get that in the second half of next year. Uh, so we'll start the work this summer and then, you know, they'll get six months to do the analysis and we'll bring it to you in January or February to give you plenty of time to make a decision on it. Hung, I have a question here. There's been some talk that this has already started. It hadn't started, has it? Uh, no, sir. We, we, all we've really done is really think about what contract do we need to hire the consultant to do the work. Because and the first step of that is hire a consultant firm to do it. Yes, sir. And we hadn't... Uh, we have not signed any contract. Well, we, you know, the last one was done by Stantec. Uh, and given their history with us as a utility, you know, that would be the ideal sort of outcome is to, you know, engage with them again. Well, there's been some statements that this process was already in motion, and uh, it's it, not. It is not. Okay. Uh, and then, so I'll just keep moving on. Uh, sort of the, what, you know, what, what does the future hold for the utility? Uh, we are lucky in the sense that we are really a young, younger utility, youngest ish, if I can say, because we started in the 70s with a couple of miles of pipe, if that. Uh, so we're relatively young, but with each year, each decade, our infrastructure gets older, and so <coughs> we are going to have to deal with that in the future. Our sort of uh, our and our budget is going to increase as we're trying to maintain these pumps, maintain these facilities, uh, maintain all these miles of pipe. The other thing to really talk about on the water side is the EPA has promulgated new rules on lead and copper, uh, basically a stricter standard. And we're going to have new testing requirements. And more importantly, we're going to have to go out and visually inspect every service connection with every customer with our, with our eyeballs to say, no, yeah, that's lead or no, that's fine. Uh, and you know, trying to do that in a, it's just, you know, you got 60,000 connections. You, you can only do so many in a day, so this is going to take a while. Um, optimization of the Yadkin water plant when it comes online, uh, and then if there are any sort of future regulations on the water side, uh, like PFAS, uh, you know, plastic in the water, microparticles, um, that we're going to have to regulate, we're going to have to find a way to filter out or clean out of the drinking water. On the wastewater side, same sort of thing, aging infrastructure. Uh, and we've talked to you plenty about our infrastructure, so you know what's going on. The treatment capacity, uh, sort of the limitations of what we, where we currently are. Uh, we have, so that's something else to sort of, you know, it's going to be before you. Some decisions are going to have to be made. Uh, we're going to bring before you an industrial pretreatment program and a cross-connection program. Um, that really needs some improvements. Andy and his staff have gone, gone ahead and done that, and we just need to figure out some things before we can bring it to the board. 
Um, again, future regulations from the federal and state government, in this case, nutrient removal levels. Uh, what do we have to take out of the wastewater stream before we can return it back to the environment? On the customer side, the customer portal is something we, you know, we're very, very excited about and some of the possibilities. Uh, been doing some benchmarking and, and really towards moving towards um, sort of the, what we call the industry standard. You may hear that a lot, not just on the customer side, but also on the other side. You know, what's the industry standard for the number of folks we should have working on hydrants? What's the industry standard? We know that there, you know, we're not, you know, it makes no sense to reinvent the wheel when somebody's already done that and they've set a standard for what's, what, what is sort of, uh, you know, high, mid, low in terms of your resourcing for a particular uh, job that's got to be done. Uh, we're going to have to look at system development fees, and that's, again, going to come to you. Um, how we handle after-hours calls, so if we get a call at 11 p.m., there's nobody in this building waiting for a phone call, and, how, and those go to a call center that we contract with, and really looking at how we do that, and can we do it better than the way we're doing it now. Um, <clears throat> and we put it here because we had to put it somewhere, um, and I think this is something you're all interested in, is finding a you know, predictable rate increases and affordable rates for our, uh, our customers uh, so that uh, they can plan for their future in terms of what their costs are going to be. Uh, generally, supply chain right now is an issue. If you come on the construction side, we just can't, you know, there, some things are just difficult to get. Um, and it is what it is. Uh, we'll deal with it as best as we can and where we need to find alternatives, not just in the construction side, but also on Andy's side in terms of uh, procuring chemicals and the like, uh, you know, we're always looking for alternatives. Cybersecurity awareness is, uh, you know, we're, we have a heightened awareness now because one, the manager made all of us go through training, so we're much more aware of it. And two, uh, you know, some of the reports that we've seen now in uh, other utilities and how they're affected by uh, cyber attacks. Uh, inflation, again, sort of related to the supply chain. <clears throat> Everything is getting more expensive. If we do nothing, if we provide no more service, it's still going to cost us more because inflation is, you know, inflation is what it is, and, uh, and I'm sure I don't need to tell you more about it. And lastly, and I know others have, other department heads have talked about it, but recruiting and retaining staff. It's cheaper to keep our folks than to go hire new people. Um, competitive pay benefits, salaries, you know, work schedules, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, I know Mark talked about it last, uh, what the last time when he was presenting to you about his department. Um, yeah, but you know, good staff is hard to find. And I had a statistic. So right now, with about 155 or 56 positions, we are running a 17% vacancy rate. And that is uh, all told three through nine. That's 27 vacant positions. Uh, the majority of which are uh, obviously in water and wastewater operations because that's where most of the positions are. But try, we are doing everything that we can to uh, recruit new employees. We're working with HR. We've gone to job fairs. We're advertising pretty much nationally in trade journals. But finding good folks, good engineers, uh, good, good technicians, um, good call takers, it is, it's a challenge. And, it, and I will just say it's not unique to us. It's pretty much, I think, across the board for every county department. Um, with that, that is the last of it for me in terms of talking to you about uh, Union County Water. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for just the opportunity to talk to you about what I'm really, you know, Union County Water. I'm really excited by the stuff that we're doing. And I hope, uh, I hope we can make a difference for Union County residents. Yes, sir. <coughs> um, what is the uh, the income from rate payers this year for this in the budget? What was the income? Um, our budget, I think, shows seventy two million dollars for the water tradition. I think our income from rep, uh, from rate payers for service is, I think, probably like sixty million dollars. Is that right, Amy? Amy will get you the exact number. And then um, the system development fee income. Uh, system development fee is not, not a, well, it is a lot of money, but it's not anywhere compared to that. It's about $5 million. $5 million. It's $72 million, $72 million in um, total revenues, so, so that would include um, our other miscellaneous revenues. Yeah. It does not include system development fees. We do not 
Uh, we don't budget, budget those. Budget for those, we appropriate them as their What was the number she said? She said $72 million, including um, system development fees? Not including system development fees. Okay, from, from like rate payers, rates, fees? Yeah, yeah charges and that all, sort of All other yes, income. Sir. And then what is our operation cost? What does it cost us to run the business? Um, not not any savings to the side. I get you. Um, so I think that's about fifty-six million is what our operating cost is on an annual basis. It's so how much? About fifty-six. Say again. Fifty-six. Fifty-six. Million. So there's a obviously if you do the math, there there's about a sixteen million dollar difference. So we got about sixteen million dollars left over, and that's what we're saving for future projects. Uh, that goes into yeah um, our I, into Pago Capital. For, to pay for future projects. So about $16 million a year? Uh, depending on the year, yeah. Okay. And $5 million is coming from the system development fees? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Now, we don't have a fund balance there that's building aside from system development fees, do we? Uh, we do have financial requirements for how much cash we keep on hand as a utility. Um, so, okay. yes, we do keep cash on hand. And that's that's required by uh, some regulatory. That and some of the fine. Well, I think it's board adopted policy. But we, as a result, also of some of the bond covenants and everything else, we have to keep a certain amount of cash on hand. I probably, yeah. And the five million dollar short line and the five million dollar transmission per year comes out of this profit, doesn't it? Uh, it comes out of the the. The revenue excess, the excess revenue that's over our cost. Would what I'm asking, it's not included in that. It's not. It is not in the expense or the operation. No, sir. So it sounds like there's a lot, but once you take off our all our voted on and approved expenditures, it whittles it down. Yes, sir. One more question: How, how much is in that revenue fund right now? Uh, I, I don't know at the top of my head. Well, we can certainly get that number for you. So, like, it's a, similar to our 20%. What's our policy? 365 days of operating expenditures. So we keep enough cash on hand to cover 365 days of operating. So a year worth of operating. So $56 million? Roughly, but, I again, we'd have to go back Plus and get Plus depreciation. You. Plus depreciation. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, so fifty-six million plus. What's the depreciation? About seventeen or eighteen yeah. million. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm say yeah. almost nineteen. That's a, yeah. So fifty-six plus about nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I just like to thank you for all the detail on this. I, as you all know, I love detail, and. Uh, um, I appreciate your presentation, huh? Very good. Thank you. Um, just one of the, one thing. There are a lot of things I could point out here, but uh, the new permit capacity tracking system. I'm looking forward to, to that initiative, and I would imagine uh, that's going to be pretty important uh, as we look ahead, to perhaps to delegation of uh, DEQ uh, permitting authority. So uh, there's a lot to look forward to here. And uh, again, thank you for. Uh, this presentation in, in a lot of great detail. Appreciate it. And when I was giving John all that praise, I, I was amiss, remiss not to say I realize it's a team. Uh, but, you know, who comes up here and stands at the podiums, the, the one we sort of hear. But I know there's a lot of people behind them, all the way down to the gray shirts and the field. So well, thank, thank you. you. And do we want to take a break, maybe a five-minute break? Yes, please. Sir? Yes, please. Yes. We'll come back in uh, at 320.
Let's uh, go back and I'll turn it over to our legal counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, commissioners, I have a short and concise presentation for you after which you will have some time to discuss and deliberate amongst yourselves uh, regarding really the single question is whether or not to engage in further research and study on abolishing the Union County Water and Sewer District. Uh, abolition, that sounds like an antiquated term, but it's actually out of the North Carolina statutes. That water and sewer district has some history to it, uh, some of which I will not go into today, and I'll be happy to discuss in closed session under uh, attorney-client information if you desire to do that at a later date. But you'll recall that that was established by the Board of County Commissioners uh, back in 2017. The district is a completely separate legal entity from Union County as a legal entity. Uh, as part of an interlocal agreement, the district operates the water and sewer system that is owned by the county. So we own all the stuff as the county and the district operates the stuff. At the time of its establishment, the district had slightly different worded legislative powers from the county's powers. The district itself establishes the rates, uh, fees, charges, uh, as you all are aware, and then the county approves. So that is that uh, little maneuver that we undertake every time there's an action of the district where you all put on your Board of Governors hats and make a decision for the district, and then uh, after that you put on your Union County Commissioner hats and make a decision on behalf of the county. Those district operations uh, are not just, the, the complexities of those district operations are not limited to the dual board actions. And I've got several things here, including that one. Uh, the, we've already discussed the adoption of rates and fees. Uh, the Board of Governors holds those separate meetings and takes separate actions for a variety of things like budget adoption, uh, public hearings. Uh, there's additional accounting necessary to facilitate. Uh, the interlocal agreement and the operations. Uh, you heard uh, the Public Works Administrator uh, today in, talk about the complexities of this. Uh, when I discussed this with our, our finance head, uh, she had also a nearly religious-like exultation at the prospect. Um, I take no opinion on this one way or the other. Uh, we're, we're here to execute on what it is that you decide to do but the district abolition does potentially simplify some operation of the water and sewer system. In order to do that, there is a statutory process and then there are some practical considerations. As complicated as the dance between the district and the county are in their day-to-day -day operations, it is at least as complicated, if not more, although over a much shorter window of time to disentangle those things and to have the county just stand on its own. But in order to have that happen, there's a public notice, there's a hearing that needs to take place and certain findings that you all have to make by resolution. Whenever you make the decision to abolish the district, uh, there has to be enough runway to make sure certain things happen uh, and it takes effect at the end of a fiscal year. So whenever you take it, it circles around to the beginning of the next fiscal year to become effective. Some of the practical considerations are uh, terminating the interlocal agreement between the district and the county. Uh, there are formal actions you would have to take. That's rel relatively simple. There are ordinance revisions that need to be made, and that is more than simply doing a find and replace for district and county in the statutes or in the ordinances. There are a number of things that have to come apart, be collapsed, they go away, other things need to be beefed up. Uh, that would take a little bit of time, but you all would get those put in front of you. There are. Uh, finance and budget implications uh, as well as operational implications uh, for the, uh, the staff in Public Works. And then there are probably some changes we need to make to our insurance coverage, including uh, some things related to the end, of the end of the district should you choose to go there. So again, the question is whether or not to continue exploring potential abolition of the district there are a number of aspects that would require substantial additional research and consideration. 
we would want to come before you and present the benefits and, and risks of doing so. Staff would be very happy to research that issue and come back with additional information, but it's enough of an organizational lift that we feel like we really want to get from you all what your sense is, move forward or stop uh, in, in researching that. If you say stop, that's fine, all, all the engines stop. If you say move forward, we have quite a bit more additional information that we would want to gather and bring to you, not just from the legal group, but from a variety of county departments. So with that, my part is finished. Uh, you all can discuss and at the end, if you could, just let us know whether you would like staff to proceed or not with the abolition of the district. Commissioner Helms. I think uh, <clears throat> I was telling Commissioner Williams I was a little taken back not <clears throat> not being aware of this. Uh, I don't know that I have enough information to, to decide today whether or not to proceed or not. I need to have a better understanding of the process. I think it might be a good opportunity for two-on-ones to, to educate us and let us come before uh, the community and make educated decisions. So, Mr. Mr. Commissioner Williams? I, I, I do want to point out that we're not actually asking you to abolish the district today. We're asking do you want us to bring you back additional information for you to consider that at a point. So. Um, that's what I was saying with the two on ones. If yes, you give me the give me information that we can make, you know, a knowledgeable decision, Absolutely. which which way to go? Because I don't think it's. I mean, I sat in on the formation of the the district, and there were some formidable reasons that we had to, we took that route. And I want to make sure that we do the right thing. Yes, yeah, just to pivot off of what um, Assistant County Manager uh, Matthews was saying. Uh, I understood general counsel was basically inviting us to decide, do you, do you as a board want us to research this further? And if so, you know, uh, a motion would be appropriate. So, I mean, I'm in favor of getting more information on this. I mean, um, clearly, uh, at least from the big picture, there's some advantages uh, in terms of financial reporting, in terms of operations. Um, you know, there's some advantages potentially to uh, getting rid of the uh, current water and sewer district. So I'd be happy to make a motion. I will make a motion if uh, at the end of discussion, um, you know, to have uh, staff uh, explore and research the uh, you know, advantages and disadvantages to abolition of the water and sewer district. Commissioner Russian, you have any questions? Thank you. Um, have no problem with you researching it, coming back to us. Uh, I think that's a good idea. I'd be one less uh, level of government burden on, on you guys and, and us. <clears throat> uh, I do want to make sure that we don't endanger those that five million dollars a year in system development fees. <laughs> that's uh, you know I don't want to have to go back to court and have that in jeopardy. So of course that would be part of something I'd like to hear maybe uh, behind you know closed session that, that uh, from the attorney. Okay. That issue is uh, on our radar already. And we're tracking that pretty carefully that's one of the areas we need to take a look at thank you well we have a motion uh, to tell legal counsel to proceed along with public works all in favor and, and just, uh, just to be clear the motion to, to come back with more information yeah yeah the motion yeah. is to direct staff legal counsel uh, in particular but to direct <coughs> staff uh, to further research um, the advantages and disadvantages of abolition of the water and sewer district um, so that might be presented to us at the appropriate time. And Commissioner Helm, as soon as we vote on this motion, I'll make a motion for us to instruct the manager to do two on ones. That'll be fine. Okay, we have a motion, as Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman Williams said. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, I want to make a motion to instruct the manager to, with the clerk, set up two on ones for availability. Uh, if I need to be the one, I will, and I'll do whatever works out for the other commissioners. So, uh, motion to do, instruct the manager to do two on ones to help us grasp this. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Nail on that one. Okay. <clears throat> Any 
Any other things, Mr. Manager? I don't have anything uh, else of uh, business value for the board this afternoon. The only other thing I would like to do is to wish our clerk, Lynn West, a happy birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Lynn. 39 or 40? <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah. Okay, uh, and I would ask also when, on these two on ones, when you come back, you could present it in open session too, so that it would be for everybody to see what we heard to better grasp this. There, there will be further presentation in open session. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, thank you very much. I have a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, staff.